this is a unique situation, uh, but we're doing the best we can, and we're thankful to have the resources to be able to present uh, our lesson to you in this fashion. Uh, our lesson today is coming from Jeremiah chapter 31, and our family theme is Joyfully Hope in God's Promise. Uh, it's interesting, this lesson was prepared over a year ago through all the process of curriculum development, uh, but its message is exactly what we need to hear today, how we can have hope in God's promises, even in times of uncertainty and in times of trouble. Uh, our first question, imagine your home is surrounded by an enemy that is threatening to invade. Uh, uh, you're trapped inside the city walls and cannot escape. We probably kind of feel that way. Uh, th this is a, s a lot of unknowns going on around us, and it is, there's issues with travel, there's issues with gatherings, and some of us are feeling like we're, we're trapped. And this is a glimpse of what the people of Jerusalem were experiencing in the days of Jeremiah. Uh, their situation was the result of their disobedience to God and breaking His covenant. Now, a covenant is an agreement between God and His people. And as long as they were faithful to Him, they were able to enjoy His blessing. They, their crops would be blessed, their uh, families would be blessed, and they would have national peace and security. And they would also be able to live in the land. Those were some of the key components of God's covenant uh, through Abraham and through the entire nation of Israel and Judah. And all of these promises were conditional. God was using the threat of the Babylonian invasion to bring His people to repentance. And so that brings us to this question, is this pandemic God's judgment? And others have raised that question and, and some have, have proposed that it's God's judgment on the world because of all the bad things that are happening. But is that necessarily the case? I mean, is, is this like the plagues of Egypt? I don't think necessarily that it is. Uh, yes, people all over the world need to repent of sin and turn to God. It's always wise to turn and draw closer to God when bad things happen. But sometimes bad things happen uh, just because the world's a sinful place. Sometimes bad things happen because of people's poor choices. But ever since Adam sinned, he introduced consequences of that sin into the world, and we have death, we have destruction, we have trouble, and we'll continue to have trouble in this world. But it's important for us to realize Jesus addressed this issue. Uh, there in Luke chapter 13, uh, there were some people who told Jesus about the Galileans who were killed by the Roman governor Pilate, and Jesus answered them and said, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus pointed out that we need to repent of sin. We all need to repent of sin. What does it mean to repent? And why is repentance necessary for a Christian? This would be a good time for you to just pause the video and discuss these questions with your friends and your family who may be with you. Today's lesson is a reminder that even when bad things happen, God's Word gives us hope and assurance that He gives grace and will restore joy and peace to His people. That's an important thing for us to learn. And we read about that in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 1 through 14. God will restore joy and peace to His people. Thus says the Lord, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built. Again, you shall plant vineyards, and shall enjoy the fruit. I will gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Say to him, say he who has scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. And my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Here, God is promising that He's going to restore joy and peace to His people. Jeremiah was facing a, a national crisis. The Babylonian Empire had surrounded his city, and they were threatening to come in and destroy everything. They had already made a couple of other invasions into the country. Eleven years earlier, Daniel and his three friends had been taken away into, into Babylon, Babylon as teenagers. Uh, they were carried away as captives, 
and actually, when they got into Babylon, they were elevated to positions of influence. So because of their faithfulness and their relationship to God, they were having a good life, a good experience, and they were accomplishing God's purpose for their lives, regardless of the circumstances going on around them. And we have their stories today that inspire us and encourage us. It doesn't matter what the enemy is doing. God's working in these situations. And they had a right relationship with God regardless of the circumstances. And they served God faithfully right where they were. And so God's telling Jeremiah, I've got a plan. I'm going to work my plan. They haven't even been carried away. The rest of the nation hadn't even been carried away yet. And here God is promising, I'm going to restore. I'm going to rebuild. The worst of the destruction hadn't happened yet. But before God's judgment on the nation, he was giving them encouragement. So I think we can be encouraged even in our situation today. God's in control. He's got this. And he's going to be able to build us up, provide for us, and take care of us. We're always dependent upon him. God spoke to Jeremiah of his plans to restore peace and joy to his people Israel. And we can have peace and joy today regardless of the uncertainty, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of our, our financial world, regardless of what's happening around us. God is aware of it, and he can give us peace and joy. We can experience true joy by walking in a right relationship with God. Why does walking with God in a close, obedient relationship lead to peace and joy? What can we do that will help us walk in this close relationship with God? Later in Daniel's life, we read that he, he really got in trouble for his relationship with God. Uh, because of his integrity, uh, his enemies couldn't find anything about him that they could find fault with except his relationship with God. And so he was faithful to pray every day, and they found a way to use that against him. And Daniel ended up in a den of lions for praying. Well, what was he praying? Well, we read in Daniel chapter 9, he said, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. Daniel was confessing the sins of his people. And he was praying for forgiveness for the sins of his nation. Even though he personally may not have been guilty, he sensed that there was need to pray and repent for the sins of his nation. Why was he praying that? If you'll go back to 1 Kings chapter 8, this was King Solomon's prayer of dedication to the temple. And in that prayer, it was a rather lengthy prayer, but in that prayer, Solomon said, if your people sin against you and you're angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned. If they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, and pray to you toward their land and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. This was Solomon's prayer 500 years or more before this situation happened in the lives of Jeremiah and Daniel. And God was even then telling what was going to happen. They didn't know this was in effect a prophecy, but God was prepping them to know what to do when that situation happened. And when it came upon them, when they found themselves carried away captive, Daniel knew exactly what to pray. He needed to pray for forgiveness and ask for repentance for the sins of his people, knowing that God would hear and that God would accept our prayers of repentance. See, this is not just a history lesson. This is an example of how God works. 
God will accept our prayers of repentance. In verse 15 we read, Thus says the Lord, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. I have heard Ephraim grieving. You have disciplined me, and I was disciplined like an untrained calf. Bring me back, that I may be restored, for you are the Lord my God. For after I had turned away, I relented. I was ashamed. I was confounded, because I bore the disgrace of my youth. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. God was promising assurance that he would hear and he would re forgive those who repented. A couple of th things that are key in this passage. First, Ephraim was of the northern tribes, and they had already been carried away captive by the Assyrians. Uh, the, the tribe of Ephraim was kind of a representative of the northern uh, nations of, of Israel, and they didn't even exist. They had no national identity at this time. But here God is even saying, I'm going to bring back even those lost who have departed from the, from the nation of Israel. He, he knows how he's going to bring his people together. And another verse there is about Rachel weeping for her children. This was along the journey that they would be taking. The route that they would be leaving from Jerusalem to Babylon would go past the place where Rachel had been buried when, when she died. And this was a reference to, actually I think what would be pointing out in the future when the children would be killed uh, at Jesus' birth, uh, when Herod tried to kill Jesus by eliminating all the, the boys born in Bethlehem at that time. This reference, uh, this verse is referenced in that uh, passage in Scripture, again showing the connection that God's people had been suffering and God's people would continue to suffer, but God was hearing their prayers, God was concerned for them, and even in this early point, He's kind of giving a picture about the coming Messiah. There's even making references to the fact that God has a plan and He's bringing Messiah into the world. And we can see even the connection in the passages in the Old Testament how this is going to come to play and we'll connect the dots later. God will accept our prayers of repentance. God's love endures. And He will gladly remember His wayward people in mercy. We can trust that if we repent of sin, we can rejoice in God's mercy. Because how do these verses demonstrate both God's holiness and His mercy? God desires to bless and live with His people. We see in Jeremiah 31 verse 23, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God promises that he is going to bless and live with his people. In the new covenant, God promised to work within the hearts of his people. Now, walking closely with God in the new covenant was accomplished by what Christ did on the cross. Christ's death is what made it possible for us to have forgiveness of sin. Christ's new covenant was not like the covenant with Abraham, where there was the law and all of the ceremonial practices and all the sacrifice. Christ was the sacrifice that made possible this new covenant. His sacrifice is what made possible to, for us to all have forgiveness. So how can we ensure that God's law is written within us? That was what He promised in this new covenant, that He would write His law in our hearts. How does He accomplish that? One of the ways is that we read His Word. Uh, we 
find that if we have engaged in God's Word at least four times in a week, research tells us that will have a significant impact in our relationship with God, in our relationship with others, and even in how we feel emotionally. God's Word is important for us, and it's His message to us. So especially during these days of quarantine, when we're cut off from most other people, this is a great opportunity for us to draw closer to God, rest more on Him, identify ourselves in Him, and, and learn who we are in Him. When we can't do all the things that we normally do, who are we? Who are you when you can't go to work, when you can't go to your activities, when you can't be around your friends? Who are you in those private times when it's only you and God? Because ultimately that's really who we are. God desires to bless you and live with you. And He can be with you even during these quarantine times when we're cut off from other people. God is with us. We can enjoy His presence. It doesn't matter what happens. God can work with it. He is with us and He'll continue to be with us. In closing, we have this question. What can I do this week to cultivate God's law in my heart? And then finally, how can I be the hands and feet of Jesus during this current crisis? What is it that I can do can I call someone? Can I encourage someone? The things that God has put in your heart, the ideas that He brings to you, use your creativity. Let Him bring to your mind ways that you can help others. Even though we may not be able to do everything that we would like to do, there are some things we can do. So don't lose this time. Invest it, use it wisely, and be able to accomplish what God's purpose is in your life even through this time. We also encourage you to check out the free resources at d6home.com. Uh, download the free family app. Uh, this has a lot of activities. There's some family fun questions. Uh, there's some other resources that you can use while you're at home. And there's also all of the D6 family devotional magazines. So your entire family can have access to the D6 family devotions at this time. So we continue to pray that God would be with you during this time, that he'll bless your family and that He'll use this time to help you draw closer to Him and recognize that this didn't take Him by surprise and He can work in your life and continue to bless you and be with you.